I bet even the biggest Disney fans don't know all these secrets about Disney's Hollywood Studios. Hey everybody, it's Molly with Mammoth Club and I'm at Disney's Hollywood Studios today with back with another video in our Secrets series. Today we are headed on some of the most popular rides in the park, Rise of the Resistance, Tower of Terror, Rock and Roller Coaster, and more, and I'm going to spill all that imaginary goodness, the details, the backstory, the Easter eggs, the things that make these attractions so special, and I guarantee you'll learn something by the end. I hope you're ready, I hope you're excited. Let's get going, there's a lot to do. this adventure with one of the most popular rides not only here in Hollywood Studios but all of Walt Disney World the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. Tower of Terror opened up in 1994 as well as all of this street Sunset Boulevard making it the first major expansion of the park after it opened up in 1989. The tower is one of the tallest things in Walt Disney World standing at 199 feet tall. If you remember from the Animal Kingdom video, I explain why it's no taller, and that's because anything over 200 feet has to have a big red flashing airplane beacon on it. That would destroy the force perspective, the scale, so Disney likes to make things just under 200 feet tall so they don't have to put that big flashing beacon on top. But one of my favorite things about Tower of Terror, it was actually struck by lightning. If you've been on the attraction, if you know the story, you know that's a big part of it. But yeah, during construction, it was literally struck by lightning. If you are using Genie Plus in this park, which I do recommend, I encourage you to book Tower of Terror second after Slinky Dog Dash. It does fill up pretty soon, usually the second one to go after Slinky Dog, and it's of course very popular, as I said. The theme of this attraction is that we are visiting the Hollywood Tower Hotel, which was struck by lightning on Halloween of 1939. 20 years after it opened and the family that was in the elevator at the time was taken to the Twilight Zone and now you're headed there as well. I love looking at that dark spot where the tower was clearly struck by lightning. You can see where the holes where that uh, was struck as well. One thing that's interesting as well is the CEO at the time, Michael Eisner, wanted this to actually be a hotel you could stay at. <laughs> And uh, Michael Eisner had some pretty wild ideas, and that I think ranks among the top of them because to have an attraction that functions and operates with guests coming and going off of it also be in the same place where guests are trying to stay and rest and sleep and live, you know, shoot for the moon, Michael, but that one wasn't going to work. Hi, Goofy! Goofy, are you checking in? Are you trying to stay at this hotel? Yeah, I don't know that you want to stay here, Goof. Hi, Goofy! Hi, Goofy! And Max! Oh my gosh, they're so cute. Sometimes they appear here as a little surprise. <laughs> Hi, Goofy! I love you! I love you too, Max! <laughs> they're so cute! Sometimes they pop up here as a little surprise. I think they're trying to check in, but I don't know that this is where they want to stay. Love a little surprise and delight character. Okay, we're headed into the lobby now where some of the best detail is. I absolutely adore this lobby and a lot of the items in here really are from the correct time period. They went to LA auction houses and estate sales and mansions and such and they uh, find all these old antiques to put in the lobby. So one thing I want to point out are the glasses on the desk there. Those are from an episode called Time Enough at Last where a man, all he wants is time to read um, and then he ends up in an apocalypse world and he's alone he's excited he can finally read but then he steps on his glasses so he is essentially rendered blind and I relate to that because before I had laser eyeballs I was essentially blind without my glasses as well also if you look over on the uh, bulletin board here they are advertising the tip top club the orchestra we're gonna see them again um, at the end of this adventure but if we were coming to the hotel in uh, 1939 or before we could have been treated to some orchestra music one of my favorite things about the lobby is that you can see where things were frozen in time when the lightning struck and uh, everything disappeared you can see things like board games frozen you can see lipstick on glasses and champagne for a newlywed couple that was celebrating here. You can see glasses left as well and it's just a fun like clue that uh, something happened here that people didn't expect and that people were taken in the middle of everyday activity. This is probably my favorite Easter egg in the lobby area. If you look at this directory, look down and the letters have fallen to conveniently say take the stairs. 
<laughs> That's so good. I love it. And one of my favorite things to tell people is if you've ever wondered how Disney makes these cobwebs that you'll see at attractions like Tower of Terror and uh, Haunted Mansion, well, did you know you are actually helping make those? Because every now and again they get a little too heavy, they gotta take them down. So they have this thing that's basically like a hot glue gun that they spray up there, and then natural things connect to it and stick on it, like dust, skin, hair. You're welcome. You made this. Thank you. For starters, you are going to be greeted with Rod Serling, the host of The Twilight Zone, and they took one of his lines from the episode called The Good Life and put it into the Tower of Terror pre-show. But what about the rest of the episode? What about the rest of the pre-show where he's talking about the haunted elevator and the Hollywood Tower Hotel? That didn't come straight from an episode. The Imagineers had to carefully piece together clips of those 156 Twilight Zone episodes to make his mouth look like he is moving in the correct order. They also had Rod Serling's widow handpick the voice actor who would voice the rest of the pre-show here, they ended up with a gentleman named Mark Silverman. Uh, so it's pretty cool to know Rod's actual wife was involved with picking his voice actor for the pre-show. While you are in the pre-show in the library, there's several little things to look for from certain episodes of The Twilight Zone. If you look up in the top shelf above all the bookcases, you will see a tiny little spaceman. He is from an episode of the show called The Invaders. Also up there, you'll see like a little devil box with like a little guy sitting on a box. Um, it was a fortune telling machine from an episode called In the Nick of Time, which starred a young William Shatner. Hmm. There's also a trumpet from an episode passage for trumpet. And in one of the pre-shows, the music the trumpet is sitting on is called what? No Mickey Mouse? I wonder if Bax would consider that a hit. Speaking of hidden Mickeys, if you look in the video of the family that is cursed on the elevator, notice the plush the little girl is holding. It's a Mickey Mouse stuffed plush. Make it down to the boiler room where you've got your maintenance service elevators. It always reminds me of that Titanic Adventure Out of Time board game I played as a child. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Um, you often get murdered in the boiler room. So it was very scary as a child. But a couple of things to look for when you're actually on the attraction. If, especially if you sit when you're looking at it, the right hand side of the elevator, if you go in and to the right, you will see the operation license for the elevator. This one's got a couple of different cool Easter eggs on it. First started, the certificate is number 10259. That is the date the Twilight Zone premiered on CBS, October 2nd, 1959. Additionally, you'll see that it is signed on Halloween 1939, which is again the day that the tower was struck by lightning and last but not least it's signed by someone named Cadwallader which is from an episode of the Twilight Zone where Cadwallader ends up being the devil in disguise so if that's not ominous I don't know what is. A few other things to note about how this attraction works operationally you are actually falling down faster than gravity because you're being pulled down in order to pull you down effectively there are cables pulling you down at 39 miles an hour um, so you get a more of a rush of that falling sensation Additionally, while this attraction, when it debuted, had the same drop sequence over and over again, it is now completely random. The elevator decides how you are going to drop. Are you going to go up first? Are you going to go down first? What's going to happen? What are you going to see? It could change ride to ride. Each ride does get one full drop down the 13 stories, but the rest of it, it's all up to the tower. And last but not least, probably the scariest thing about this attraction isn't even the drop, it's when you get off. Uh, right as you are done with your fall, look and you will see a dummy named Caesar. He's a ventriloquist dummy from an episode called Caesar and Me. He's a haunted ventrilo ventriloquist dummy, which is absolutely a nightmare and again, scarier than the actual attraction itself. Legend has it from the Tower Hotel staff that if they don't say good night and good morning to Caesar every day, bad things happen at the attraction. It'll close for no reason. It'll have the suspicious downtimes and maintenance issues. So I don't want to say that he's real, but... On your way out you can notice that this is the sunset room this is where the dining room would have been at the 
Hotel, and you can see the menu for Halloween night 1939. Looks like we're having oh, some gherkins, some, some turtle soup, grilled fish, some beef, lamb, chicken, calf's liver, deviled quail. Wow, we are really running the gamut on the proteins. Uh, peas, peas, cauliflower, an autumn salad, and uh, ending with the apple pie. So that's lovely. Then you exit out in the Tower Hotel Gifts, which would of course be your hotel gift shop. Again, you're going to see a lot of those artifacts that they recovered from estate sales and things. I think that's so cool. I love that the Imagineers, when they are theming an area, if they can get real authentic things, they will. And I just think that'd be such a fun job to like go to estate sales in LA and try and find all this old you know, teens, 20s, 30s stuff to decorate with. Uh, and then again, as I promised, we are going to see another advertisement for the Tip Top Club, which feels like it would be a really good time. And I'd like to go. If anyone's seen the film with Kirsten Dunst and Steve Gutenberg, you would know the Tip Top Club is a good time. And one more detail to point out, probably the thing the least amount of people notice is that, again, the tower was struck by lightning on October 31st, 1939, which means it was Halloween, which means they have decorated. So if you look in the windows here at the hotel, they've got their jack-o'-lanterns and they're ready to go. Basically, it's always Halloween at the Hollywood Tower Hotel. It's starting to rain and rumble, which is probably bad news for my slinky dog lightning lane, which is next. The good news is, though, this is actually a pretty good park to be in during the rain because Slinky Dog is the only outdoor attraction. Rock and Roller Coaster, Tower of Terror, Rise, Smugglers, Mickey and Minnie's, Toy Story, those are all inside. So there's very little here that closes during the rain. Is it raining? Yes. Did Slinky Dog close? Also yes. But are we gonna march on? You bet we are. I got a sweet stack of lightning lanes, including Rise of the Resistance. Somehow, the genie god smiled upon me today. So we keep going. It's also not raining that hard. I'm also being dramatic. What are you gonna do? Not ride fun rides? No way, Jose. Onward to Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. Made it inside Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. This is the newest ride to join us at Disney's Hollywood Studios. And it takes place here in the Chinese theater because... Whoa. Welcome to Florida. It takes place inside the Chinese theater because you have been invited to the premiere of Mickey and Minnie's newest cartoon, Perfect Picnic. Now, a lot of you will wonder what Mickey and Minnie and Disney have to do with the Chinese theater, uh, but actually several Mickey and Minnie cartoons did debut at the Real Chinese Theater in LA, and so did other classic Disney films, such as Mary Poppins. So it does fit in here, which a lot of people had questions about. As you weave your way through, hello, you will notice that they are advertising a variety of different Mickey and Minnie cartoons. The new style of cartoons, I'm, I'm not sure if you're a fan. They're not my fave, personally, especially what they've done to Goofy. But you'll see uh, advertisements for ones like Potato Land, the one with the panda, etc. But it's in this room that I want to point out a very cool Hidden Mickey. This attraction has more Hidden Mickeys than any others uh, because, of course, it's Mickey and Minnie's first ride. Why wouldn't it? But I think perhaps the coolest one is up here in the light fixtures. You can actually notice that Mickey's profile head is in those, which is very, very cute. I wish Minnie was in there too, but we'll take it. Pay attention to the cast member costumes as well. Hello! You'll see when you're here. Oh, can I show your costume? You are a very dapper movie usher, but pay attention because those are going to change when things go awry headed into the pre-show. Now, this is one of my favorite parts of the attraction. It sets up the story. It sets up what we're looking for. It sets up the B-plot that a lot of people don't know about, and it's got one of the coolest effects ever. Pay attention to Pluto in the pre-show, and then we'll talk about why he's important. I just love this transition, and now we are in the cartoon world where things are wonky. 
things are silly. But I do love that pre-show because of the effect. And I love that song, Nothing Can Stop Us Now, quite the earworm, but I enjoy it. It was written by Christopher Willis, who does compose the music for the Mickey Mouse shorts, but he also has done music for Twilight, the Winnie the Pooh uh, 2011 version, Grown Ups, one of the Shrek movies, Veep. He's been nominated for Oscars. He has been nominated for Emmys, uh, Grammys, so pretty big deal, and it's very cool that he is part of the Disney family. I love when a ride has original music. Throwback to things like Pirates and Haunted Mansion with that. As you can imagine, an attraction all about Mickey and Minnie has a lot of really cool detail, a lot of really cool Easter eggs to look for. It's like overwhelming the amount you can look for on this attraction. This attraction does use the same trackless technology that you'll see at Remy's Running Sweet Adventure, at Rise of the Resistance, which means whichever car you get in, you could get a little bit different view of the show. But if you're in the back of the train and the train cars are going to change, you'll notice that B-plot I was talking about, and it's Sweet Pluto trying to deliver the picnic basket to Mickey and Minnie. It's so cute and a little sad. When you go into that first scene, take a look at who's bicycling through the park. It's the Dapper Dogs aka dogs in the Dapper Dan outfits. I absolutely love it, one of my favorite nods. You'll also go under a number 1928 as you drive through the park. 1928, that's the year Steamboat Willie, the first Mickey Mouse cartoon debuted. As you go through the subway sewer system, you will see that they are called iWorks Waterworks. iWorks is a nod to Ub iWorks, one of the original cartoonists of Mickey Mouse, often forgotten. People talk about Walt drawing Mickey a lot, but Ub iWorks uh, is actually credited with the first like Mickey that we know today. So I love that nod to him. You'll also see 1901 in the sewers. That is a nod to the year Walt Disney was born, December 5th, 1901. As you head into the construction zone, you will see Pete with a jackhammer. Behind him, there is a hidden Mickey in the ice cream scoop. And you will pass a building that is at the address 1401 Flower Street, which is the address of Walt Disney Imagineering out in California. Also in the room with Pete, if you look at the newspaper, in the newspaper box, the headline is Oswald Wins, a nod to the original Disney cartoon, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. He famously was lost in a legal battle between Disney and Universal before Mickey Mouse was invented, and it was on the train ride back from that conversation in New York that Walt Disney thought of Mickey Mouse. It was decades and decades later, but Disney finally reacquired the rights to Oswald, so Oswald Wins is on the newspaper. Now, if you know this attraction, you know that it replaced the Great Movie Ride, much to a lot of people's chagrin. But of course, there's a few nods to the Great Movie Ride throughout the attraction. For starters, when you head into the carnival scene, you will see a poster for a ride at the carnival called the Great Moving ING Ride. Additionally, the next scene you go into is a tornado, which is very cool because there was a tornado scene cut from Great Movie Ride for technological and budget reasons. They had to cut a scene where you were picked up by a tornado a la The Wizard of Oz. So the next scene is a tornado, which is a great nod to that missing scene and the famous Wizard of Oz scene within the attraction. Now this one's really hard to see, but on the tornado is a mailbox. And if you were to slow it down, get the right angle on that mailbox, it actually reads, No Place Like Home. Lastly, from Great Movie Ride, as you head through, uh, after the dance studio, as you head through the neighborhood before you get to the Smasher uh, machine that's going to take us all down with Mickey and Minnie, you will notice on the left-hand side, there is a waste pa uh, a trash can, and it shakes and rattles, and a cat meows in it. It's the same sound effect from the gangster scene in Great Movie Ride, which is a very weird, very niche, very hard to hear, but very cool Easter egg. And once Mickey and Minnie save the day and you see them finally reunited with Pluto having their perfect picnic, on the street signs you'll notice a few things. For starters, on Fish and Hole, the O is a hidden Mickey. You'll also see one arrow pointing to Yen Sid Valley. Yen Sid is the name of the sorcerer from Fantasia because Yen Sid is Disney spelled backwards. Okay, but it's Goofy, you're being very loud. Okay, but possibly the coolest Easter egg is an audio one. Listen to the train whistle. The Imagineers use the same way. Goofy! What I've been trying to say is that the Imagineers used the same whistle that they used to make the Steamboat Whistle in Steamboat Willie in 1928. They used that literal same whistle to make the train whistle on this attraction. Chills, literally. Also, not to leave you hanging with the cool costume easter egg, if you look now at the costumes of the cast members, they are inside the cartoon and they're train conductors.
Pride's so cute. I love it. I think it's normal, and I notice more Easter eggs every time. So lots of good stuff to look for on that one. Now we're going to brave the weather and head to back two. Now is as good a time as any to remind you to prepare for this when you visit Florida, especially during hurricane season, which is the summer through the fall. It does this pretty much every single day. So make sure you pack your ponchos, your rain jackets, your waterproof shoes, your stroller covers. Even if it says it's not gonna rain in the weather, the weather's lying to you. It's gonna rain. Be prepared, plan your indoor theater shows, your indoor activities, your meals during the height of the uh, late afternoon because that's when it usually happens. And you know what they say, even, even I have to agree that a rainy day in Disney is better than a regular day pretty much anywhere else. So even I, who hates getting wet, have to agree with that sentiment. I'm very sad though because Rise the Resistance is closed right now. And that's obviously on my list of popular rides to ride. So let's hope things turn around. Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, aka Star Wars Land to most people, opened up officially in 2019 with the marketplace here, the restaurants, Oga's Cantina, and Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run. And then a few months later, Rise of the Resistance opened. The lands themselves have an incredible, incredible amount of detail. It's one of the things I love most about these lands. I'm not even a diehard Star Wars person, but I am a diehard Imagineering person. And the detail in this land is just, it's mind boggling when you learn some of the Easter eggs and secrets. So of course, we are gonna head to the fastest hunk of junk in the galaxy to spill some of those secrets. Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run. Did you know this is the first time a full life-size Millennium Falcon has ever been built? Which I find pretty incredible considering these movies have been out since the 70s. I'm surprised it took that long for someone to build it, but Disney did and opened up again in 2019. I love looking at the detail of the ship, knowing that the cockpit is right here that Chewie and Han would have piloted. And a cool detail outside on the ship itself, if you look, let's locate it, let's locate it, give me a second. It always takes me a second. If you look under the cockpit, kind of under that ventilation shaft, there's actually a miniature model of the Millennium Falcon stuck under there. So it's Millennium Falcon Inception. This is why we pack our patient pants. This is why we pack our patient pants. I am going... The Falcon is so loud. If you listen closely, you can hear that they're trying to power up the Falcon. We are headed into Onaka Transport Solutions, run by Hondo Onaka, a more or less good guy, uh, maybe a little bit on the Slytherin side. Uh, you know, looking out for number one. We can't blame him for that. Definitely a smuggler. We are weaving through his operation, Onaka Transport Solutions, uh, and he is borrowing the Falcon, which he will let you know from Chewy. Now going through the lightning lane like I am right now, you do miss part of the queue and a couple of cool Easter eggs. For example, you can see that some workers were playing Sabak and there's a game left abandoned. You can see that they are using Stormtrooper helmets as drip pans, but you don't miss a lot of it when you are going through the lightning lane, which I do recommend for this attraction because it gets a very, very, very long line. And while it does have single rider, single rider is not fun on this attraction because this is one where you, along with a crew of five others, are gonna fly the Millennium Falcon and you want to do this with your friends and family, I promise. It is way more fun. You'll have two pilots, two gunners, and two engineers. Pilot is arguably the best position. You can request a position from the cast members as long as you go through standby or the lightning lane, not single rider. Luckily, you don't miss the pre-show by going through the lightning lane. You are going to see one of the most impressive animatronics in all of Disney World in Hondo Onaka. And if you listen closely, you may recognize his voice. He is voiced by Jim Cummings, who's a Disney legend who also lent his voice to Tigger, to Eeyore, to Stinky Pete, to the former narrator of Illuminations over at Epcot. So it's really cool that you can hear him here. And I don't know about you, but I was just here Tigger when I hear him talking. A cool thing to look for around the queue, both at the entrance and the exit, is you will see that there are some creatures that have made themselves uh, habitants here. A little pork nest hiding there amongst the coils. 
One of my favorite Galaxy's Edge details that you can see here as well, if you look at the number on all of the trash cans in Galaxy's Edge, it's the same number as the trash compactor from A New Hope that Luke, Leia, and Han get trapped in. The walls are Don't just stand there, try and brace it with something! <laughs> What's really interesting about the plot of this attraction is that it directly ties into the story on the Galactic Star Cruiser, the Star Wars, like, live in theater 48 hour escape room hotel. And it makes the attraction much more enjoyable if you've been on the Star Cruiser because you know how the uh, the mission fits in, which I do think is cool that Disney tied that into it um, and it kind of elevates an experience you may have already had if you're paying to go on the Star Cruiser. Food for thought. I personally very much enjoyed the Star Cruiser when I had the chance to go. I know Max, Allen, and I would love to go on the Star Cruiser because uh, we're very into things like escape games and, and uh, interactive experiences. But I'd be curious if any of you have gone on the Star Cruiser and what your thoughts have been. And yes, I agree. It's incredibly expensive. I love walking on this catwalk because it actually kind of weebles and wobbles like you're getting on an airplane. And once you go through here, you will be aboard the legendary Millennium Falcon. And it truly feels like you are stepping onto the set of the film, onto the Falcon itself. It's a dream come true for Star Wars fans. It's absolutely incredible. There are for sure some notable things you're going to want to take your picture with. Once you are aboard the Millennium Falcon in this room, you're going to see a lot of things uh, that diehard Star Wars fans are going to notice immediately. Things like the chess table where they play Dara Jeek. You better let the Wookiee win. Look above the chess table and you will actually see the helmet and the seeker droid that Luke uses to first learn the ways of the lightsaber and the force. Additionally, right here, you are going to see the wall where Han and Leia first share a smooch. So there's a lot of cool details, my Star Wars fans. I can only imagine what it's like to set foot on the Millennium Falcon. After you've been dreaming about it for 40 plus years, it's pretty cool that you can literally step aboard the Millennium Falcon and it looks just like it did on camera. Look down and you'll see the stairwell that takes you down to where you sit to fire the blasters like Finn does when he's helping out aboard the Falcon. And as you leave, depending on how well or not well you do, depends on how damaged the Falcon is when you get off, which is very, very cool. It's a very fun little nod right there. One of the coolest Easter eggs to look for when you're actually on the Millennium Falcon is towards the end when Chewie's autopiloting you back in. Make sure you look at one of the ships that's going to come across kind of the bottom third on the left hand side that's actually the star speeder 1000 which is the ship from star tours as you pilot your way through batu so it's very cool that like in this universe the ship from over there is flying past your ship right here and as you exit onaka transport solutions there's one more very cool wall that you might want to scope out i found it here at one of the exits there's actually a Rathtar in Carbonite, which is a nod to obviously Han being frozen in Carbonite. And in, uh, when you meet him again in Episode 7, he is hauling Rathtar. So one got stuck right there. Oops. Should we make Rathtar wall selfies a thing? I like Millennium Falcon Smugglers Run just fine. Um, I usually feel like I'm intruding on a family's memories in the back as the engineer because I always, as a single rider, um, get stuck as the engineer. And then even when I'm like not in the single rider line, I usually let other people have the better positions. But this attraction is very, very fun when you are with your family, especially if your family likes Star Wars. It's fun to make fun of your uncle who's a bad pilot. It's fun to laugh with your nephew who's trying to be the gunner, which is why I recommend either doing standby or lightning lane. Um, but the line gets really, really long here. So recommend either rope dropping it or waiting till later in the day when it drops a little bit if you're not doing lightning lane. Update, Rise the Resistance, still closed for technical difficulties. Slinky Dog Dash, still closed for weather. Looks like a bigger storm's rolling in, but for now, I just fiddle-faddled and I pulled a rock and roller coaster for like right now. So 
Let's go see Steven Tyler. And then we'll deal with what we gotta deal with. Sunset Boulevard, I feel like I was just here. I was, but that's okay. This is a small park. As always, this is not how I would direct you to like do the park on a, a perfect day or a best day or how you should navigate the park. These videos are really fun for me. Definitely a passion project for me to be able to just spill all these fun facts about these awesome rides that make the rides so much better. And so I'm just kind of going in the order I can pull lightning lanes if I'm being honest. But Sunset is a great place to start your day, especially if you're a resort guest. Come in with that early theme park entry and come down Sunset. You can knock out Tower and Coaster pretty quick. Uh, that frees you up to book Slinky Dog as your first Lightning Lane and then Millennium Falcon as your second one. All right, Rock and Roller Coaster starring Aerosmith. The only attraction that puts you upside down in Walt Disney World. In fact, it wasn't always going to be Rock and Roller Coaster starring Aerosmith. They talked to some other bands as well, including the Rolling Stones. But I think it fits perfectly with Steven Tyler and the gang. Right outside the coaster, of course, you've got this gigantic guitar. It's actually 40 feet tall. You'd have to be roughly 80 feet tall to play it. So a giant could, could play that and then go golfing with the Spaceship Earth golf ball. Oh, by the way, when I said I fiddle faddled to get a lightning lane for this, that just means I refreshed the page over and over and over again till one popped up. I talk about it a lot in the different Genie videos I've done. I recently did one about the new Genie Plus rule, the new park hopping rule. You can check that out if you want some more Genie Plus tips. Now Rock and Roller Coaster does have a single rider line. It's not usually that quick uh, because they get backed up with technical difficulties in the Lightning Lane and Standby and the single rider's just filling in odd seats. However, you can always ask a cast member if they think it's moving quickly. But for me, Lightning Lane is the way to go here, usually. Probably the most interesting piece of trivia about this is kind of a Disney cult, like, favorite kind of fact. During the pre-show, Steven Styler is going to say to his manager, wait a minute, I love that idea, and he's going to go like this. He didn't always go like this. For many, many years, he made a different hand gesture, and then they photoshopped his finger back. I'm not going to explain to you what the hand gesture meant beforehand, but just know that Steven Tyler's finger is photoshopped and it's kind of one of those weird Disney things that Disney nerds like to joke about. The story behind Rock and Roller Coaster is that you are headed on a backstage tour of G-Force Records. You are going to see some artists, maybe, who knows, who knows if anyone will be here, but maybe you could see an artist recording. You're going to learn about the music business. And then, of course, oh my gosh, you happen to see Aerosmith. Who could have predicted this? Which is why you get backstage passes to head to the Aerosmith show. Because Steven Tyler cares about you. He wants you at the show. That's pretty nice. You know how he feels about his fans. What do you want to do? Send them all with you? Yeah, now we're talking. Inside the recording studio on the right hand side, take a look at that amp cord because it is wrapped up to make a Mickey on the ground. So that's a fun thing to point out, especially to your younger ones. Once in the alleyway, take a look at a few details for starters. Some of the signs uh, instructing you to watch out for the construction are nods to Elvis. Additionally, there's an electrical box that has 1401 flower on it. If you remember from Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, that is the address of Imagineering in Glendale, California. Rock and Roller Coaster is certainly an intense thrill. It goes zero to 60 in 2.8 seconds. And a fun thing is that you never know what music you're gonna get. The limos not only have different names, different license plates, but they play different Aerosmith songs. My personal favorite one is Love in an Elevator because they changed the lyrics at the end to Love in a Roller Coaster. Another funny joke to look for in the load area is the construction company is Sam Andreas and Son. Uh, they will help with different earthquake help, which is funny because the San Andreas Fault is, of course, a big cause of earthquake concern. And lastly, once you get off your rockin' roller coaster trip, look at the name of the car wash uh, that you can see up ahead on the left-hand side. The car wash is called Wash This Way. I got my favorite song, so things are going great. All right, I looked at the app and Rise and Slinky are open again, so fingers crossed I make it to them. Because it looks 
rainy again, so Slinky's a concern. And Rise is always a concern. <sighs> made it to Slinky Dog, well, made it to Toy Story Land, and Slinky Dog is operating. So I'm gonna do that one first, and then Rise, because I'm afraid, while I'm afraid both will close again, I'm more afraid that the weather will take down Slinky again. Jesse, could you be quiet? I'm trying to talk. Like the entirety of this land, Slinky Dog Dash takes place in Andy's backyard, where Andy's larger-than-life imagination has brought to us new adventures because we, friends, have been shrunk down to the size of a toy. So Andy has made a roller coaster in his backyard using some of his favorite toys, including his Slinky Dog and including a Dash and, dash and Dodge car track that reminds me of Hot Wheels. Anyone else have Hot Wheels? This is like the Hot Wheels of the Pixar Cinematic Universe. I just love the incredible detail of this land in general. If you look around, everything is made of toys. These are blocks. These are Tinker Toys. Connects make up some of the railings. You've got the green army man, men. You've got the pencil with the little eraser cap. You guys remember those? Hanging up the Christmas lights. It is so incredibly creative and so incredibly detailed just everywhere you look on the premise of this being Andy's backyard. Slinky Dog Dash is incredibly popular, so definitely recommend using Genie Plus on this one. They usually go for the entire day within a few moments of it being 7 a.m., so book this one first. Occasionally I'll see it pop back up again, but it's very rare, so I like to lock this one in right at 7. The first cute detail in the queue, if you look on the back of the standby wait time, you'll notice it's actually a dog tag for Andy's dog, Buster, and there's the address right there on the back of the tag. And then much like the entire attraction is incredibly detailed, so is the queue. You can actually see the boxes of the toys that Andy used. You've got the Slinky Dog box right here, and then you're gonna weave closer to the Dash and Dodge box when you get to the load station. But throughout here, you will see things like the instructions for making the Dash and Dodge track. You will see glue, you will see safety pins, you will see tape, and it's just the detail. I can't get over it, like, unbelievable. Like here, you can see Andy clearly reached into his mom's push pin little container. Some of them are the flat silver ones, some of them are the colorful ones. I know anybody who has a desk has one of these little push pin containers that's just got a plethora of things. Oh, it's just this whole land. I'll never get over it. The next specific Easter egg to look for is the box right here. You've got Rex's box. Of course, Rex looks like he's a, supposed to be a little more ferocious than the character we know and love. But take a close look at that price tag. You'll one, see that mom bought Rex at Al's Toy Barn, the pivotal location in Toy Story 2. But second, you will see he was $19.95 and you'll see those barcode 1122. That's because the original Toy Story came out in theaters on November 22nd, 1995. You've got the box for Slinky Dog right here too. He's we, he's uh, the squeaky penguin bath toy you can see Andy wrote in crayon, Wheezy right there. But then here's my favorite part. We know now why Wheezy's squeaker doesn't work anymore because he is not for use in water. Why would there be a bath toy not for use in water? I don't know. Ask Al of Al's Toy Man Barn where everything's for a buck, buck, buck. But anyway, I love that we finally solved this mystery. As you head towards the loading zone, you'll see Andy's master plans for the roller coaster. Uh, you'll see that he intended to have the aliens, which that is over by aliens throwing saucers. You'll see the green army men, Wheezy, evil Dr. Porkchop. But for my hidden Mickey fans out here, aka not Duck Fist, if you take a look at the green army men up in the corner, Andy has drawn one of the clouds into a hidden Mickey. Take a look at Andy's stickers here. You'll see he has a Buzz Lightyear sticker. He's got a Pizza Planet sticker. He's even got a sticker for Spin and Marty, which was a segment on the Mickey Mouse Club in the 50s where the kids went to Triple R Ranch. It was a boys Western summer camp. And uh, two of the kids were named Spin and Marty and they uh, were the stars of the series. So a very niche, very niche little Easter egg right there. We're getting closer to the Dash and Dodge box. It's kind of where you unload over there. 
But there's another couple things to look for while you're actually on the attraction. When you get to the finale, of course, Wheezy is there singing You Got a Friend in Me. He's using that white recorder that you'd put a cassette tape in that I used to crush on as a kid. I'm sure I'm not the only one. Um, and he's got the lyrics You Got a Friend in Me behind him. But take a look up at the Dash and Dodge box because it's got the date February 3rd, 1986 and Emeryville on it. February 3rd, 1986 is when Pixar was founded in Emeryville, California. California. Now let's go ride Slinky Dog. We've been chatting a lot and it's time to giddy up. done and what I loved I noticed I've noticed this before but I forgot to say it when you get done and Wheezy singing and everything above it there's a book and it's partly cloudy that is a Pixar short another thing you can look for when you're on the attraction I I always say this this land is so so cute I'm obsessed with it and it's kind of raining a little bit and I still have it. okay rise is still open in the app so let's hope it can hang on for me to get there and ride it uh, and just because I can't resist saying one more detail in this land, even though it has nothing to do with Slinky Dog, look at the restrooms and the fact that the toy right here, cooties, brilliant. Rise of the Resistance is the best attraction in Walt Disney World, definitely the most popular attraction in Walt Disney World. It is more than just a ride. It is a 22 minute experience. There's multiple ride vehicles, multiple sets, larger than life animatronics, and it puts you in a battle between the First Order and the Resistance. It is absolutely phenomenal. Rise of the Resistance specifically takes place between episodes eight and nine, and you are here at the Resistance base to help out General Organa, as well as friends such as Ray, Finn, and my man, Poe Dameron. Of course, things go wrong and you end up in the custody of the First Order. I know this isn't a Genie Plus video, but I can't help but explain that this is a fancy ride, so it's an individual cost. It's usually $15 per person to ride this outside of your Genie Plus cost. And it's a fancy ride again, which means that if you are a Disney World Resort guest, you can book it starting at 7 a.m. Non-Resort guests can book it at the time the park opens. This attraction is so popular, it very rarely has any lightning lanes left over once it is open to all guests. If you are a Disney World Resort guest, you need to be booking this one at 7 a.m. Book your Genie Plus Lightning Lane first and then book this one. Um, but it is incredibly popular, so you need to move quickly on this one because it most of the time sells out for the entire day within just a few minutes of 7 a.m. For some reason, the Genie Plus, the Genie Gods were in my favor today. I was checking all day to see if one happened to pop up, and one did around 1 o'clock. One popped up for almost 7 o'clock at night uh, as an individual Lightning Lane, and I was able to purchase it for $15. So don't lose hope. Don't give up. But know that I have literally never been able to buy one as a non-resort guest since Genie Plus rolled out almost a year ago until today. A couple of things of note in the standby queue, we didn't see it today, but you can actually see that water suit that Finn ends up wearing uh, in the new trilogy. You also see if you look through the cargo cages, different helmets and masks and things that the Resistance has worn before. This moment literally never gets old.
this doesn't get better than that. Oh, that's the first time I read that to film for Mammoth Club, and it made me feel pretty cool. Um, very cool detail right outside here. You'll see this like gold moss on the rocks here. That is a moss native to Batu. It's called gold dust. It's got kind of a um, sweet and salty flavor. Um, they use it in a lot of cooking around here. I know this because it's in the Galaxy's Edge cookbook, uh, but the amount of detail in this land, unbelievable. A couple of things you can look for while you are riding Rise of the Resistance. For starters, in the room with Rey, when she is a hologram, she is going to talk about how her friend Finn and some Resistance crew have infiltrated a Star Destroyer. That is key information as to what happens next within the plot. After you leave the room with Rey, make sure you look off to the right-hand side because you will see my main man Poe Dameron's ship and his trusty droid BB-8 piloting it. And then once you are aboard uh, the transport, you will see Lieutenant Beck. Um, I love him. He is the same species as Admiral Akbar from the films. You also see Nyum Nyum driving the, uh, driving the ship. And within that moment, you are going to see that Poe, uh, when things get a little dicey, he says, I'll come back for you. And you can take him at his word because he absolutely does. At that point, you'll get boarded by a Star Destroyer. You'll head into the next room, and there are over 50 stormtroopers in there. But keep an eye out because every now and again, a extra stormtrooper shows up, and he is a little more lifelike than other ones. Also, take note of the full-size TIE Fighters that are docked inside that Star Destroyer. Walking into that Star Destroyer is the most incredible thing. Bar none, it gives me chills every single time. Rise of the Resistance then uses that same trackless technology as Mickey Minnie's Runaway Railway, and just like on that attraction, which car you are in on which side of the Star Destroyer does determine the path you will go on. You will either be closer to the Pro Droid or not. You will go up through different sides when you get to the AT-AT section, so if you ride it more than once, you may get a slightly different experience, which is really cool. One of my favorite details that not a lot of people notice is that when you are in that escape uh, vehicle with your droid, <laughs> When these stormtroopers shoot at you, you can actually see them damage the ship. The ship starts completely fine, and then when they start shooting at you, holes in the ship appear, which is a very, very cool detail to look for. Another one of my favorites is that as you are trying to escape, your droid is smart enough not to get in the way of those big, huge blasters. So your droid car watch you stop and start because he's letting the blasters go forward and shoot out the window because the resistance has, in fact, come back to help you. Then when you see Kylo Ren, he's of course an incredible animatronic. Some people don't realize he uses the force to pull you forward. You'll see him moving his arms around. That is to use the force to get you closer. Of course, the resistance then helps you out. When you go into those escape pods, you can actually watch what's about to happen out the window because Num Num and Lieutenant Beck get into the escape pod depending which one you're in. They drop and then you drop as well. Poe then comes back and leads you back to safety. A very cool detail is that the day, uh, the time of day outside reflects the time of day is when you crash with your pod beacon. So that way, if it's night, it will be night when you crash back in. If it's daytime, it will be daytime when you crash back in. Um, and then one thing not a lot of people realize about the story is that you don't know where Lieutenant Beck went. You will hear Finn say, where's Beck? Does anybody have eyes on Beck? You may hear the Overcom say, we have are missing contact with key personnel. And then Lieutenant Beck, who's, uh, Lieutenant Beck, whose escape pod has crashed right in front of you, comes to life and says, Lieutenant Beck here, I made it. Uh, and it's a, just a very like overwhelming and joyous moment because you and your team all made it safely away from Kylo Ren in the First Order. This attraction is without a doubt the best attraction I've ever been on. Um, you don't have to be a diehard Star Wars person to understand this attraction. My mom went on this attraction. She hasn't seen a Star Wars since the 70s. She knows good guys, bad guys. She kept calling Kylo Ren Darth Vader. It does not matter. This attraction is incredible. You have to ride it. Well, friends, we fared the weather, we made it through, we still got to ride six of the most popular attractions in Hollywood Studios, six of the most popular attractions in Walt Disney World, and I had so much fun sharing some of the backstory, the Easter eggs, the hidden details, that Imagineering magic that makes these rides so incredible. What's your favorite ride in Hollywood Studios? Let us know down in the comments. In the meantime, friends, it's been magical. Make sure to join the club. Now go watch the Epcot version of this. Bye!